So before I open the floor for questions, I would like first the three panelists that have not uh, delivered any presentation to uh, give a brief uh, uh, statement concerning their views on the uh, uh, role of the dispatchable renewable technologies in the competitive electricity market. Uh, Mr. Paspasidis. Thank you. Uh, first of all, they were very nice presentations, very informative and very interesting. Uh, I'm working for the Ministry of Energy. I'm responsible for the energy planning. And uh, definitely uh, the things that we have seen today will be very useful uh, to our, our national action plan that we're going to submit by the end of this year. Uh, one uh, of the problems uh, that we have observed in our modeling exercises is uh, exactly what you have said. It's not uh, the long-term planning models. They cannot easily demonstrate uh, this uh, reserves um, and this is not only a problem of our model but it's a problem of a European model also primes and the new model of potential that we have identified especially for small islands uh, like Cyprus uh, where there is no interconnection uh, this is a huge um, gap that is missing uh, from the long-term planning uh, uh, studies and that's why I believe uh, so far we, we are not able to identify the need of, uh, of storage. Uh, what we have done in order to solve this, uh, we have proceeded with a specific study uh, with uh, Dixieland, and we have simulated uh, the CSP plants, especially in Cyprus. We had two projects under NER 300, and we had a good opportunity there to simulate uh, minute by minute, second by second, the whole system of Cyprus, uh, both 2020 and 2030. And indeed, uh, there, the thermal storage, uh, the CSP with the graphite was a, a system with a graphite storage versus the CSP with the battery storage. It has a huge impact on the system. So we, we were able to see all of, the, all of the things that you have presented here, how important it is and we are now in, uh, in a process with the Commission to convince them that uh, their model is not uh, the right model for us, because especially for the interconnector. And, uh, uh, okay, we have replaced by that time the thermal storage with the pump storage, because it was more cost effective. But after that, we have seen that uh, water in Cyprus and uh, uh, the availability of uh, available dams was not uh, a case for our uh, system. So we, re we are uh, running uh, now the model with the help of the Cyprus Institute, I have to say, and I have to thank uh, the institution uh, that they are helping us to do this modeling exercise with the support group of the European Commission. And uh, we were waiting for the results. <laughs> Now the floor is to Dr. Kutcher. I guess I would say that um, it was nice to see that uh, this emphasis on reducing carbon emissions. I, I think that um, getting past the greenhouse gas problem, overcoming that problem is not something we should do, it's something we have to do. So it's not, not a question of you know, can we get to 100% carbon-free energy? We have to do it. I mean, it's all the studies show that the cost of cleaning up the damage from climate change is an order of magnitude greater than whatever costs are going to be incurred to get us off of fossil fuels. So we have to do that. Um, it's not just carbon dioxide, though, that I want to point out. There's a lot of natural gas that's being burned in the United States right now, a lot of fracking going on. Um, it, it's total greenhouse gas emissions. And when you, when you look at, uh, you know, you often hear that uh, natural gas has half the uh, uh, carbon emissions of coal in generating electricity. That's completely ignoring any of the fugitive methane emissions. There's about half a million fracked wells in the United States that are leaking methane into the atmosphere, depending on whether you use the 20 year or 100 year value for uh, global warming potential. It can be at the, at, the, at the 20 year value on the order of 80 times CO2. So uh, uh, 
natural gas is, is not a solution to the uh, to climate change problem. Um, I mentioned all the various things that we can do to integrate uh, renewables into the grid, uh, increase transmission, spatial diversity, balance uh, wind and solar. Uh, personally, I'm not anti-nuclear. I think in the United States, at least, new nuclear plants are prohibitively expensive, but there's 99 uh, operating reactors in the U.S., and a lot of environmentalists want to shut them down. I'm fine with shutting them down if we instantly replace them with, with other types of carbon-free energy. But if we don't do that, we get spikes in CO2 emissions every time we shut a nuclear power plant down. Um, the, the analysts at NREL, in our strategic energy analysis system at NREL, when they do all these various analyses, they've come to the point where they think getting to 80% renewable, ener renewable ener energy penetration isn't easy, but it's quite doable. They have troubles getting to that last 20%. Um, you, you look at industry, uh, you look at the fact that, uh, you know, those, those typical um, duck curves that are shown for California are like uh, in March, all right? So that's, a, that's in the spring where you have a fair amount of, uh, of, of uh, 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 solar and wind, but not much load. Uh, and so if you want to meet those summer loads, uh, those high summer loads, you wind up having to curtail them in the, uh, in the spring. Uh, and so getting to that last 20% is difficult, and, and I think a lot of the analysts feel we need to go to hydrogen, large hydrogen storage, or other type of uh, renewable uh, fuel of some sort. Uh, so that's, uh, that's one way to address that. I have some other thoughts along how to address that, but uh, I don't want to take up any more time. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Filakos. Um, I'm Nestor Filakos, I'm a researcher here at the Cyprus Institute, um, and we're working closely together with uh, the Ministry and Euros in particular for developing those scenarios for the future. And it's quite interesting what we're finding out little by little is that, uh, for, of course, we, on, the, on the one hand, we have a very isolated energy system uh, which has its own challenges. On the other hand, this also presents many opportunities uh, to uh, build a system which is going to be completely decarbonized, and uh, I think we should go towards that direction. Um, now, concerning the, um, the integration of, uh, um, of all these renewables into an electricity market, this is something that uh, is fairly new for Cyprus. This is, uh, we're going to be implementing that in 2020, if I'm not mistaken, um, and um, the details are not there yet, and I have some doubts whether this is going to be implemented successfully, um, and giving the, the right credit to renewables that it's due. Um, one thing is whether the, the EAC will use its, its position now um, to keep the status quo. AEC is the incumbent monopoly of uh, electricity production in Cyprus. The other thing is that whether we are going to be addressing flexibility of the system uh, in, a, in a manner which will uh, uh, ensure that we have stability in the future while the, 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 the electricity market is going to be running. And the third one is uh, with integration of renewables, and we're going to be having a lot of them, especially PV, uh, at least that according to the national plan, um, whether the, the market will be able to withstand pressures of speculation and whether the, the pricing for the consumers will be fair and will not go up as we have seen in other examples of electricity markets. So these are concerns for me and I don't know how they're going to be addressed. Uh, I hope, well, I have some, some ideas of how they can be addressed, but as an introduction, this is my two minutes. Thanks very much. I would like now to open the floor for any questions concerning the position so far from the panelists. Yes. Yes. Uh, when I heard your uh, your presentation, uh, in fact, it's a very thorough and complete presentation, I was a bit scared in the beginning because you were talking about in your models. Of, of hydrogen for the for 20, 220, 230. Um, I, I think it's very dangerous to speak of hydrogen. Hydrogen is not the te hydrogen technology is not at all developed to the point at which we have developed CSP, for instance. So putting side by side two things that are not at all at the same level and besides have uh, very uh, different numbers. Um, the cost of hydrogen today, if you wanted to do to the end and produce electricity, store and produce electricity with it, it would be much, much, much higher than what uh, we are talking about for CSP. So hydrogen technology may be very interesting, perhaps not for electricity, perhaps for uh, 
other uses, like in transportation, you mentioned planes and other things, yes. But to consider it today, I think it is not necessary. It's dangerous because it distracts people from what can be done today. And we don't need it. We absolutely don't need it. Uh, we have cheap ways to produce electricity and cheap ways to store energy, quite uh, besides hydrogen. So uh, I, I, I have had this kind of discussion as well with Portuguese uh, planners and policy planners, and, 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 and they were following the same direction. I told them, don't, don't do that. We don't need it. In fact, tomorrow, my presentation will be about a, one possible solution for a country like Portugal. We could go up to 100% renewable electricity easily. In fact, we are already about 50% renewable electricity. But we can go easily to 100% without even dreaming or thinking about about hydrogen. Um, so I completely agree with the approach that uh, Luis uh, gave us. Um, I do think that we, we have uh, uh, very reliably and with uh, documented experience and costs solutions today. And, uh, and, and, and we should really try to look at things in the way Luis presented. Uh, this, this approach with, I mean, in Portugal, people are also thinking of doing lots of PV, lots of wind, without thinking the whole thing, as you very well explained. And that's not the least cost solution, and that's not, and, and, uh, um, and, and so forth, and, and so forth, and that's not the one that uh, reduces uh, as much as possible carbon uh, in the atmosphere. So why pursue this? I mean, I think there is here a lack of information um, on the part of the, the, these policy makers. They don't know uh, really enough about what's available today, technologically available today, and especially sunny countries like Cyprus or Portugal or Spain must uh, do something along the lines that uh, that Luis was, uh, was was so the other two things that was not uh, that were not in your uh, presentation but maybe you consider them of course when you talk about smart grids and smart integration it's the the topic of interconnections so the possibility of uh, exchanging energy well, when you look at the uh, uh, to this at the scale of a country like Portugal or Cyprus that's one thing when you look at the scale of a Europe, Europe, it's a completely different uh, thing, and that in itself helps a lot because this simultaneous uh, availability of uh, different, yeah, that's one. And the other thing is is this um, um, topic of cur 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 curtailment. Um, in Portugal today, we are already in a situation in, in several days during the year, we have excess uh, energy production from wind and PV. Uh, and and and, and um, that means that we have to to, to get rid of this uh, of this energy, and it, it's just small quantities today, so it, it doesn't count too much for the uh, um, economic calculations. But once you're doing on a, it on a much larger scale, as you pointed out, the 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 the, the, the in, uh, invest the return on investment, and and the way the people will behave, the market will behave, uh, is is going to be completely. My final comment it's something that uh, neither of you talked about but perhaps Luis had this implicit in his presentation PV is going to come in not just in centralized production but it will come in very much in decentralized production and there the problem is different because even with uh, uh, batteries being a little bit expensive or more expensive clearly for a long time uh, at, the, at the small scale of a home owner, uh, the investment on an inexpensive battery is something that can uh, be considered uh, easily. Uh, I have other, uh, in my own house, I have other reasons to have a battery, and I'm willing to pay for it, and I will. Uh, so decentralized PV must be considered in, with a different logic. Yeah? And that will change, of course, some of these, uh, of the, some of these optimizations. Uh, so what what I think to, to finish my I already spoke too much sorry uh, what I think is that um, the, the, the 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 way uh, the approach that we are going or that we need to follow in the future has to be different from the classic uh, uh, thinking 
Uh, and if we if we let the planners, the usual planners, plan what's going to happen, we will come up with something that is better than what we have today. That's fine. I can see that. But we will come with something which is distorted and unnecessarily so. Sorry. Just to clarify, in my presentation, I just show an optimistic scenario. That's what I said. We are examining a lot of scenarios. That was an optimistic scenario with hydrogen, but I have not mentioned hydrogen later on during the results and so on and so on. Yeah. Uh, and of course, the integration uh, of the European energy system in a larger uh, power system, having um, large scale integration of renewables so on, this will be the benefit uh, with 100% renewables in, uh, in the system, definitely. Yeah. So, uh, any other uh, questions or uh, interventions from? Uh... If I could make it yes. just a point in response to that. You, you made the point that there are times when electricity, you can't give it away, right? Where it's just really, really cheap. Um, and so one of the folks at NREL is actually looking, uh, you know, we, we talk about CSP and what's the real advantage of CSP? It's storage. Well, if you got electricity that's so cheap, then you don't need CSP to generate that electricity. You take that really cheap electricity and you charge storage with it. Now you take the storage and run a Brayton cycle with it. So that it, when you, at times when you have really cheap electricity, you can forego the whole CSP collector array and go directly to storage and take advantage of the CSP advantage without buying the collectors. So, I mean, that's another thing that people are looking at. But, yeah. But we're not going to we're not going to go overnight in, into these uh, these other problems. I mean, we still have a lot of baseload coal, and we still have a lot of baseload nuclear. Those plants are operating, and, and they they have to sell their electricity very very cheaply at night. So that even that, while we're making the transition, that electricity could be used to charge storage. So that's that's one of the things that's being looked at. Well, I think, uh, I mean, every country has to do a country-specific approach. And I think it's, uh, if you have nuclear, you can get rid of nuclear, uh, okay. Uh, or, or if it is not, I mean, appropriate to get rid of nuclear because we don't have any other substitute uh, technology just to not, not to create uh, gas, uh, greenhouse uh, gases. Okay, that's that's perhaps another problem. Regarding coal, I, I don't agree at all. So, I mean, yeah, you, you can just, by, by putting CSP plants in... United States, you can get rid of coal just by uh, displacing this uh, night operation of coal without any problem. But uh, regarding what you say, the, the, the future of thinking that you may have electricity for free, more or less, I think this is something that I put in the first question mark of my presentation was, is somebody going to invest in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a system that is going to offer a lot of electricity for free? For free? I think this is not, this not unsustainable, it's an unsustainable business model. And I think as soon as the containments start to be uh, relevant, I think everybody is going to stop because the value of another PV, of another wind uh, uh, installation, which is going to cost a lot of money, is going to be almost nothing. And so uh, I don't expect that uh, renewable people will become crazy just to, for, for, for investing a lot of uh, uh, new uh, installations just for, for giving for free. And, uh, but that cheap electricity, if yeah. it's used to, to go into storage, to generate electricity at times when it's needed yeah. is no longer valueless electricity. It now has a value to it. Yeah, that, that might be the case. So I think we can offer, I mean, if we have a lot of CSP plants, we can, for those very crazy moments, we can offer the solution. But what we think is that uh, traditional renewables are not going to come to a point in which this is going to be relevant. So that's because no investments, in my opinion, will be done if the electricity is going to, to, to offer for free. But in, if uh, we can offer our systems for, for that, but new investment, even in the storage, just for coping with that, will require additional investments for a volume of curtailments that, in my opinion, is not going to be as, as high as one may think, because uh, in the offer side, the investments are not going to be done. So that's, uh, and, and investments in storage it, it, it cost a lot of money, 
So uh, if the curtailments are not enough, I think it's a kind of egg, chicken egg uh, dilemma that is not going to be to be solved anyhow. One uh, technical question. So it should be simple than two observations. Technical questions. There was discussion throughout the day about the cost of batteries vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, let's say, uh, thermal uh, storage. In the way the, there is the initial uh, uh, cost, of course, but batteries have a degradation, aging. Uh, they don't perform, as we know, from our cell phones to everything else. And it's known that they have an aging. They, their capacity decreases depending on the cycles. And the replacement time uh, changes every time I ask this question. Is it uh, two years? Is it five years? Is it, uh, we know that sorts live longer. Is that factored into your 10 or 33 we heard this morning uh, factor and a half? That's a technical question. The observation now on the, uh, I think all of you have focused throughout the day, uh, all of us have focused throughout the day, to daily storage. Seasonal storage takes cycles. Uh, we have the experts here, but I believe the seasonal variation is it three to one or four to one? It's huge. Um, California is likewise. Uh, and so far the discussion has been, which of course means excess capacity, because you have to uh, invest, and which is idle most of the time. Uh, and it's not the day night, it's the spring to uh, August uh, uh, syndrome. That has not been addressed, and certainly that's a very kind of different storage than uh, we have been comparing. Perhaps hydrogen, hydro, etc. But it's an issue in decarbonization also. There was some discussion, and there is this initiative now by China, uh, which of course goes, it's the ultimate solution, uh, but the Chinese are fantastic. They say we'll build a bridge uh, uh, 200 kilometers, and they have it next year, uh, the, of interconnecting the whole globe, uh, not Europe. Uh, of course, if you interconnect the whole globe, you need no storage uh, in an ideal uh, system. Uh, so seasonal, daily, whatever you if you go north south, the season disappears. You go east west, uh, you, uh, day night disappears. Uh, and they are serious about it. Uh, they are actually committing billions, I understand, already to uh, to build these uh, interconnectors. Because the politics come in again, as we know, in Germany, uh, they have been fighting for uh, what uh, 20 years now to get the uh, north-south. Uh, uh, high voltage line or to connect Spain to France took 50 years and then still, uh, I think uh, uh, it's an issue. So those two are the observations. Seasonal uh, storage, interconnection on a, clock, on a continental, let's say, scale vis-a-vis -vis storage. You're, you're talking sort of the maximum spatial diversity there, right? <laughs> <laughs> In the, the, the batteries, uh, the degradation of the batteries, so I, I would recommend, I think uh, there is a real study, which is, in my opinion, very well done by Jurgenson and all, uh, that uh, has been published in 2015, in which they compare uh, the expected uh, in two ways. Uh, the learning curve for batteries and also asking to the experts, the projection by the experts, how the batteries will reduce cost. And uh, they, they present a report in 2015 in which they compare uh, the, the PV plus battery solution as compared with, with CSP for three hours, six hours, and nine hours of storage. And uh, it is incredible now to see that after three years, uh, after the publication of this book, the cost of batteries remain almost the same as has been already uh, presented in 2015. So there is a big contradiction between the cost of batteries remaining more or less stable. So there is many people that think as the panels, PV panels decrease so, so largely, so quickly, it's going to pass the same, to, to happen the same with the batteries. And until now, this has not been the case. 
And until now, there are not utility scale uh, batteries for offering, as I told you, the example of Dubai is very, very illustrative in this, in this respect. Uh, but in this report, they say that uh, when you go to six hours or to nine hours of storage, because batteries, uh, they consider whether the replacement is happen every 10 years or every 15 years. And so the, there are big difference, uh, not five years, but they say that the batteries can last for 10 years or 15 years. And even in those, those old cases that seen the study three years ago by NREL, uh, in which they consider that CSP is going to cost in 2020 12 or 15 uh, cents of dollar per kilowatt hour, which is half uh, now. So we are decreased very, very, very quickly our prices. And batteries still uh, remain the same. So in no case, uh, the batteries is going to take over uh, the CSP service at a lower, lower price in one decade. So I think it is also up to us to, to reduce costs and just to be, we are now the best. There is no doubt. And when somebody asks you uh, which is the role that CSP can play, you have to say that we are the essential piece. Why it hasn't been considered right now? So it took me more than six months to convince the policymakers in Spain to say, okay, why don't you put a cap in the, in the CO2 emissions? Because if you don't put a cap, our system is going to be, to some extent, damaged in your analysis. Why don't you uh, allow us to dispatch after sunset? Because if you just put us competing with PV during as the uh, graphs that you have already showed, you put the 24 hours, but when you don't put 24 hours, you compete, you put CSP, extending a little bit the operation time, but competing with PV. So when they uh, understand me and they put these things, they say always you appear in the picture right now. And also very important thing is to put the, the, the real cost as of today because they are were using costs long time ago, and they didn't realize that the, in the tendering process in Morocco or in South Africa or in Dubai or in Australia, the cost has been very much reduced. So, by all, only by putting these kind of elements with the same kind of system or analysis, the least cost expansion models, we appear in the picture. So, I think it's something that has to be taken into account. And seasonal storage country specific. So, when you have uh, hydropower. This is the best system of storage. If you don't have, okay, you have a problem. <laughs> in, in these cases, if you don't have, if you don't have uh, pumping or, or a big hydro, you have biomass. Biomass is also a kind of, of uh, system. If you don't have biomass and you don't have uh, pumping, certainly you have a problem. Uh, CSP can last for two days, three days without any problem at all, but uh, no longer. Okay, very good. Uh, Seasonal storage. Uh, the last two slides that I show actually concerns seasonal storage for Cyprus uh, with batteries. This is what we did the actually during this investigation. Uh, but still, it's in progress. Uh, that's why I show these uh, two slides. But I would like to ask a question to Luis, if I may. Uh, you mentioned the common sense inductive approaches. Uh, is there any mathematical background behind those uh, models approaches? <clears throat> yeah, well, I have been discussing very much with people that uh, use the least cost expansion models and they say I use a Monte Carlo just to simulate that things can be different. So what I, what I say is that uh, we have at our disposal a long series of, of, uh, of, of years in which you have hour by hour the production of each uh, renewable technology. So historic. Historic, historic, historic. So what we have, our mathematical approach is just an Excel sheet multiplying uh, at uh, hour by hour. So we have produced uh, not one 2030 simulation year. We have produced four 2030 simulation years. If the 2030 will be the same as 2014, the same okay. as 2015. So and, this is an assumption to the model. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it's, I mean, it's very easy. I mean, the, the model, uh, I mean, if you have this data at your disposal in, in your countries, it's very easy just to and we, our system don't optimize. We simply put a common sense fleet and we see which is the result. But we can very easily, in, in, in one hour, change the fleet or in minutes by another fleet and we can produce as much a fleet as you may imagine and we can just optimize by interacting, by interactive approach. It's not, but it's not mathematical, it's very simple, it's transparent, there is not a black box that nobody knows what is behind the list of expansion models and we can see with a magnifier glass which are the ramps, which is the synchronous uh, level at each time, uh, not with a Monte Carlo approach, but just with a real historical approach. We can, and, and I think renewables are all about meteorological conditions. And meteorological conditions can be never better reflected than using historical data of meteorological conditions. 
Uh, I think it's about time to finish, but uh, yes. Please, uh, Nestor, and then we uh, will accept another one question, and then we'll... Um, just one comment on this uh, battery issue we've been talking about. Um, I think that we shouldn't, we shouldn't discount the fact that batteries do have a future in the electricity sector, and reality shows that they, that they do. Uh, but I think that the, the advantages, we haven't really highlighted them very well. The main one is that they are very, very quick to respond. So they're in, in the, um, on the side of... Uh, of Centralized generation um, power plants can use them basically to ba balance the load very quickly, which is something that thermal storage cannot do because it has certain inertia. The second thing is the role in distributed generation, and uh, uh, what Manuel has said is very, very true. Um, and we also have lately this hybrid approach of having actually large battery uh, packs of uh, basically uh, using a centralized storage for, for consumers, for actually uh, people that uh, generate uh, power in their homes. And there have been 100 megawatt system by Tesla basically installed in Australia very recently. But in uh, in uh, in the long picture, when we talk about uh, um, over uh, in front of the meter storage on the side of, of generation, I don't think batteries right now have a future, and they can compete with uh, thermal storage central in a centralized way. Maybe in 30, 40 years, but as trends start stand right now, they have the future. They have their place in those applications that I said. But I don't think that they, they can right now compete with centralized uh, storage offered by uh, thermal means. So, if I may say a very, 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 very short I heard very recently uh, the Spanish TSO that says they are tracking exactly which is the amount of energy produced by decentralized systems and by centralized PV systems. And the result is that the efficiency of decentralized systems is half of the efficiency because you put in on the rooftop, uh, not exactly looking to the south, but uh, you perhaps as some kind of shadow during the, uh, and so it's not optimized, it's not movable at all. So you have to take into account that, okay, decentralized is good, but perhaps uh, when you compare, it's not always better uh, you uh, deduct the cost of transport or, or distribution. Because uh, the, the, these are facts that in Spain, decentralized PV systems are producing half of the uh, centralized PV systems. Uh, but I think, okay, I think it's a smart approach and a smart grids and all these other things will, will find a way. And certainly, when we uh, consider how much uh, electricity needs to be generated by centralized plants, we have to deduct how much is being generated by decentralized systems, which is a growing sector in Spain and everywhere in the world. And this has to be taken into account for our, our uh, modeling process. Yeah. Yes, but it, it will happen uh, for several reasons. One is in connection with electrical vehicles, because we will like to charge our batteries in the future. And the second one is in connection with the disadvantages you say are real, but there are advantages as well. The point of consumption is there, no losses in the grid. Uh, I mean, there are, I mean, things compensate also somehow. But another advantage of centralized PV, there are real economies of scale. There's a lot of marketing costs and sales costs and installation costs associated with, you know, individual homes. I mean, I have one on my house, but there are people that buy into community solar, and it's actually quite a bit less expensive on the larger scale. I wanted to say one thing about yes, about. Just compared to the public play at home, there the decentralized PV is competing with the 20 cents per kilowatt hour campaign. Mm -hmm. So I'm willing to pay more. I don't care. It can be. It can cost much more than this. Uh, while when we discuss centralized production, we are discussing five cents. So it's a completely yeah. different score in terms of uh, what costs and what I'm willing to pay. I want to say one thing about battery costs, and that is, you know, the Chinese, of course, played a big role in driving down the cost of PV modules with a lot of government support. Right now, electric vehicles are really taking off in China. Uh, and I think the propagation of electric vehicles in China could serve to really drive down the cost of lithium ion batteries. And so, you know, we have to see, it's hard to predict, but there's the potential for all those Chinese buyers uh, driving down those battery costs. We're running out of time. Uh, just one statement. It seems that storage actually is uh, a necessity in order to have large-scale integration of renewable energy sources and for the renewables to become dispatchable. Uh, and uh, let me also state, Costas, that uh, I have already discussions with the Chinese, and I confirm that they would like actually to purchase all the interconnections around the world, even future interconnections. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>